So Jackie and Rebecca, welcome, uh, Jackie, to the ICA podcast, Health and Wellness episode um, in May. Uh, Jackie McIlwain is the president of the Association for Body Mapping Education and is the associate mm -hmm. professor of clarinet at the University of Southern Mississippi. She's an active solo chamber and orchestra musician with performances at festivals, conferences, and independent events across the USA, Panama, Colombia, South Korea, and throughout Europe. In addition to teaching and leading the clarinet studio at USM, Jackie also teaches a body mapping course and presents this material at many universities international festivals and conferences. Jackie has conducted research in musicians' injuries and hopes to influence music educators and students to embrace body mapping in the music learning process. Jackie, again, welcome to this episode. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. I uh, am excited to talk about body mapping. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, we're going to just start off with the most kind of general question for all of our um, viewers um, who may not be familiar with somatic education, but maybe, Jackie, you could just explain first in general what somatic education is for the sake of our listeners and viewers who don't know. Absolutely. I'm happy to. So, um, somatic education is where we focus on how the body moves. So it's, it's not the, the internal movements of, of our organs or anything like that. It's more of muscle movement and mus musculoskeletal movement um, and basically how we are designed to move so we can move more freely. And so there's different methods within somatic education and body mapping is one of those methods. Great. Thank you very much. So what is body mapping? As you mentioned that. Body mapping, mapping is an organization and body mapping is an act. Yeah, absolutely. So um, body mapping is a method that um, has basically kind of stemmed from Alexander Technique. And um, Alexander Technique was, um, was developed around uh, the 19, uh, around 1900 or so. And um, it was an actor who kept losing his voice and he kept going to doctor after doctor and no one was really able to help him very much. And so he realized, well, maybe I'm doing something with my body that is causing me to lose my voice. So he started um, studying anatomy, started kind of playing around with some things. He created a room that was filled with mirrors and watched himself. And so he came up with this technique and then around 1980 or so, um, one of the Alexander Technique teachers that was really well known in the United States, her name is Barbara Conable, um, she realized that as she was working with students, that when she started just basically talking about the anatomy and just, you know, thinking about, okay, how is the anatomy constructed? How are our bones, how do they fit together and how we move? And if we can learn that and really understand where those bones and joints are within the body, within our own body, that we will have freer movement, that there's less tension. And so that's how body mapping kind of came around. Um, and so basically with body mapping, we talk about how how the bones are, are structured, how our alignment is important. And then from there, we kind of dig in deeper and we talk more about the, the muscles and how the muscles move the bones and things like that. But from a very basic like starting standpoint, we really kind of start with the base skeleton. Um, and so it was at that point um, when when Barbara realized like, oh, if I'm just talking about some of this basic anatomy, then we're able to move more easily and more freely and with less tension. Um, and so that's kind of how it, it, it got started and what it is. And I can give a very simple um, demonstration of what body mapping is. Um, Absolutely, that would be great. Awesome. Okay. So I use this a lot in classes whenever I'm talking about body mapping and like, what is it? And 
ah, you know, we, we do actually have a body map in our mind, in our brain. It's laid out. We, we have learned as we, as we grow, how our body is, um, constructed and how we move. And every once in a while, there's just a, a slight misconception about where something is or, um, the structure of it. So we talk about the size, structure, and function within body. So a very quick demonstration that I like to give is um, take a look at the palm of your hand, okay? And we're just going to take a look at these the joints um, within the fingers, okay? So we have the first joint right here where this crease is, okay? And then we have the second joint of the fingers right here where this second crease is. And then we have a third crease right here. Okay, so this is the third joint of the hand, and I want you to just take a moment, and you can wiggle around your hand or your fingers, however you want. It can be fast, it can be slow, you can do this, um, and you're thinking about moving from this crease right here, okay? And then I want you to take a look at the back of the hand, okay? The back of the hand, we, we can see these joints right here. We have the first joint here, the second joint right here at these places right here. And then we have the third joint at these knuckles right here. Okay. So if I were to place one finger on a knuckle, it doesn't matter which one, I'll just use my middle finger right here. So I have one finger on this and then I, I put my thumb on the complete opposite side. Okay. So I'm, I'm making sure that I'm on this knuckle right here and that I'm nice and even. The third joint of the finger is actually right here. Okay, so I played a little body mapping trick on you. I had you take on a false body map right here. And then this is the true, um, where the true joint actually is. So now I want you to wiggle your fingers from where this joint is, where the true joint is. And then you, most people will notice that, oh, it feels different. It feels different to move from where the joint actually is. Um, do you guys feel a difference? Yes. Yeah. It's easier. So pretty much what you're saying that we we have the crease right at the base of the finger and we might think that the joint is there, located there. So we might actually want to um, move our fingers from that crease from the, um, um, uh, well, not legal joint, which is not there. But if we actually map it that the joint is right here, a little bit lower on this side, then we, we get a freer, more natural movement of the fingers, right? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Because if we think that the, the, the joint is right here and we try to move from it, the joint, there's actually a bone right there. We can't move it, but we're trying to move it in that way, which takes extra effort, takes extra, and causes tension. Um, and so if we can, you know, make sure that we have an accurate representation of our body map, within our body, then yeah, this movement right here is gonna be a lot freer and take a lot less effort. Absolutely, that's great. So you mentioned the um, a body map as a representation of our body in our brain. It's a neural representation. Um, how does body mapping, can, can body mapping or mapping the, the structure of the body, can it, can, can it change the neural representation in the body or does it stay the same? Absolutely. Great question. The body map is changeable. So we can correct our, our misconceptions that we might have or maybe assumptions that we've, we've developed um, throughout our life. And we can correct that body map and change it so that we can move more freely for sure. Absolutely. That's great. So there's no age limit to changing the body map in the brain, no. right? None. It's for all ages. It's like Legos. Zero to 90. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, I have one more question. You mentioned that Barbara Carnival started yeah. to um, branch off from the Alexander Technique in the 80s. Um, and I remember reading an article a good couple of years ago uh, that was... Uh, um, authored by by her and David Smith, talking about balance, balance. And in that article, I remember them writing a very striking definition of balance that really threw me off. And it was it was such 
that um, balance is the bone to bone relationship, <laughs> nothing else. Yeah, as bones, they, they relate to each other. And I thought a lot about that since then. Exactly. And it, it so makes sense that actually balance is based on our structure, how, how the bony structure related to each other. Um, <clears throat> and so there was a lot of other things that I, I, I read about body mapping that I, I came to and that actually helped me in my personal and professional endeavor to understand my body better. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the the association? So when did when did the association for body mapping education um, uh, come about? What is the size? What is the scope? What is the coverage in the world? Yeah, of course. So um, the Body Mapping Association originally started, um, I believe it was in the 90s, and it was entitled Andover Educators, which um, if I understand this correctly and remember this correctly, it was the name came from um, Barbara Conable's street. She lived on Andover Drive or something like that. And so she created this organization, Andover Educators, because they would come, you know, her students would come to her house. And um, so that's kind of how it got started. And um, in 2019, I believe it was, we actually changed our name to the Association for Body Mapping Education, basically so that people would, would know what we do based on our title. Of, of the organization. And um, so it was um, a really wonderful time where we feel we can um, reach more people in that way. And right now we have about 300 active members and it's from people all over the world. We have a lot of members from the United States and Canada, but we also have some in Australia, South America, um, all over. I mean, it's really an, it's an international music organization. Um, and of course, we want to uh, broaden that we want to reach as many musicians as possible. Um, so it but it's really exciting. We've grown a lot in the last few years. Um, and I think it was something crazy, like by 400%. Um, and so we've had some really amazing leaders within the organization who have really um, expanded our name and, and gotten our name out there. And, and so I'm, I'm hoping I can carry the torch and, and keep doing that and, and allowing more musicians to know what body mapping is. Absolutely. Thank That's you very great. much. Yeah. Um, so Jackie, how would you say um, for people who don't know that body mapping differs from other somatic branches? Sure. So, um, you know, there's so many different somatic practices, so many that I'm sure I don't even know them all. And I, because I don't know them all, I can't speak specifically to all the other ones, but I can tell you a little bit more about body mapping and what um, makes us unique. Um, one of the things that I learned as I was, as I was studying Alexander Technique and body mapping was that with, for instance, Alexander Technique, there's a lot of hands-on guidance from the teacher. Um, and I absolutely loved that. Loved that. I, I felt like in that moment, I needed that. As I became a college teaching um, professor, I realized that I, I needed something that was... Um, more knowledge-based and and less hands-on guidance um, for many reasons, many reasons. And some of it was just, I wanna make sure that both the student and I are comfortable. And um, and so that's really one of the reasons why I, I dove into body mapping. Um, and, ooh, excuse me, my AirPod just fell out. Um, okay, so. I, I really enjoy the fact that it is very much knowledge based. It is, I can ask a lot of questions in lessons. Um, for instance, if I'm talking uh, about a body mapping lesson, it's not specific to clarinet, a body mapping lesson, I will ask questions to help students 
um, kind of do some self exploration and I can guide them with um, models. Like I have a skeleton in my office. His name is Hamlet. He's very nice. He doesn't talk back. It's great. Very <laughs> Um, I have, I have other skeleton models. I have images at my disposal. So I have lots of different ways that I can communicate this information. Um, and the thing that, that I really love about body mapping is that the students can take that exploration and embody it within them, their, their own bodies. So it's, it's a really wonderful somatic practice. And especially if, um, if someone is is wanting something that's not quite as hands on, um, it actually works really well to teach on, online for body mapping. So, thank you. That's very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Um, as you mentioned, that uh, one of the difference between other somatic education branches is that body mapping is not a hands on practice, right? Do we, does do body mappers still apply some hands on? when needed or it, it's it is it can be a totally um distanced uh, guidance i i think that it really depends on the the comfort level of the teacher and the student okay. um i i i sometimes will use hands-on instruction um and and it's more of okay let me let me hold your arm and of course i ask this um i always ask for permission to, to touch a, a student. Um, and that's very important. Um, but you know, I'll, I'll hold their arm. So like their elbow would be in my elbow and I would just kind of support their arm like this and just kind of wiggle their arm around. And it's actually really quite challenging to let go into that and allow somebody else to hold your arm. And so that that can be really eye-opening to a lot of students. Um, you know, I, I I remember for myself, the first time a, a teacher did that to me, she she kept saying, it's okay, you can let go. I was like, I'm not trying. I'm trying. <laughs> and, and then I and then I would let go and then it would and then it would just kind of grip again. And I was like, okay, all right, I can I can do it. I can let go. And so um sometimes there is some hands-on movement, but it's not uh, a significant amount, and it's always done with consent, for sure. Absolutely, thank you. I I personally have experience with uh, professional body mapping educators, um, Alexander Technic educators, as well as Feldenkrais educators, and I can attest that that there's a different focus in each of those branches and a different approach, and a, 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 obviously a different influence on the body. Um, <laughs> So you mentioned that you were already a university professor when you uh, came across with body mapping or started implementing body mapping in your own praxis. Um, how did it change you, the way you play, and what what change can a clarinetist experience by taking body mapping lessons, uh, reading materials, and um, and just implementing? those principles? Sure. Okay. So um, I have a lot of different answers. I'm hoping I can bring them all together. Okay. So when I first started studying body mapping and Alexander technique, I was an undergrad. I was experiencing a lot of pain in my right arm. My right arm would go completely numb up past my elbow when I was performing. And um, I was having so much pain that it was really starting to impact me and my clarinet playing and my ability to you know have a career in music and so i was really really fortunate to have an alexander technique teacher at my university within the school of music and my clarinet professor said you should go take a lesson with her so i did and i i had no idea what I was getting into. I had no idea what Alexander Technique was. She was also certified in body mapping as well, but I had no idea what any of this was. And I, she said, walk down the hall. And I was like, okay. So I walked down the hall and I walked back and I was like, what on earth is happening right now? What's going on? And she um, addressed some things that I was doing with my arm structure. And 
very, very quickly, I could tell a huge difference. And I was like, oh, okay, I need to take her class. So I took her class. That class changed how I approached clarinet. I started to take care of myself more and realize what my body was trying to tell me. Um, I was able to free up a lot of tension. I was able to feel the tension, release it which that's a whole process in itself. <laughs> um, but by the end of that semester, my breathing capacity was completely changed. I was able to play long phrases, beautiful sound. Um, no numbing. And, I'm sorry? No numbing of the arm. No. By the end of that semester, all of those, for the most part, that was pretty much healed. Now, I did continue studying that. And I, for the rest of my undergraduate degree, and sometimes it did come back, but then I would be like, okay, all right, I know, I know what I need to do. Then I, I got a little cocky. And when I went on for my master's, I was like, I don't want to be the weird, weird girl who's laying on the floor doing constructive rest. So I, and I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm fine. I don't need this anymore. So then... <laughs> I hurt myself even worse uh, and which I had to take four months off the horn and um, it was, it was a trying time for sure, but I knew what I needed to do. I got back into body mapping and Alexander technique lessons. And by the end of my degree, I was, I was pain-free and I was able to play. Um, I, I knew my body's limits. I was able to respond to that. And that was amazing. Um, so I finished my degrees. I, I got this job, this amazing job at Southern Miss. And I started noticing some alignment issues with my students. And I could recognize it because of, you know, the, my experience that I had had, but I didn't have the knowledge or the, the um, tools to help them fix it. And I was not happy with that. I was like, I see that something's wrong, but I don't know what to tell them that would make it better and not compound the problem. So that's when I sought out body mapping training. And um, I was, I think I started that in 2015, I think. And by the time um, 2017 rolled around, I became licensed. And it has been such an amazing journey. From, I mean, this whole time, you know, ever since undergrad to now, because I, I'm continually learning. I don't know everything about the body, Absolutely. but I'm always learning and I'm always experimenting with my students and with my own playing about how can we take this information that we're constantly learning and apply it into our own bodies and into our playing and it's just amazing the differences that I can hear in my students and they feel. Um, it's really quite remarkable. So I, I, that's why I got into body mapping and that's why I chose to get trained in body mapping because okay. I could see that. I could see the difference. So what have you seen in clarinetists before? Specifically, is there a pattern that clarinetists carry in terms of the usage of their bodies that uh, body mapping has helped so many? Or what, what would you say? Oh my goodness. Okay. So there's so many benefits. Um, and one of the things that you know, we as clarinet players struggle with is the right hand. And some people have the left hand, but the right hand I think is more common just because of the weight of the instrument is resting on our right thumb. And so there's a lot of um, tension issues with, with the hands and the arm structure. Um, breathing as well. Um, those are the two things that I think are um, the most impacted um, with within our body use is the tension level, especially within the arm structure and our and our breathing, because we, we have a tendency to use too much effort, um, maybe in the wrong places, possibly. And then that that kind of takes a toll on our clarinet playing. Absolutely. You, you talked about the right arm and the numbing that you have. Um, what do you think about the use of a neck strap? Do you think it helps or interferes with the principles of body mapping? Sure. I think that it's really up to the person and how they 
their body responds to the next rep. Um, I have a very dear friend of mine who is um, certified in Alexander Technique and in body mapping, and he uses the next rep and uses the next rep as um, basically as a cue, like to check in with his alignment and balance. And so that's very useful for him. For me personally, whenever I use a next rep, I the pressure, it, it, even if it's just a collar, um, I, I've noticed that if I'm wearing a collared shirt, I have a tendency to kind of come, my head kind of comes forward. And so even just something as subtle as a collar can affect my alignment. Um, and that's something I've noticed about myself and that I just find it better that I don't use an extra app or, you know, and that I pick my, my clothing carefully. Um, and so for me personally, that just having the next rep there, it, it kind of gets in the way of the, the bony structures and it changes the alignment. So it would put pressure on my neck and I kind of would come forward a little bit like this, which you can actually hear a difference in my voice right now versus whenever I'm in balance, then all of a sudden there's everything is freer. When I'm using an extra rep, it also interferes with my breathing because of this misalignment that starts happening. So not only am I, is the strain going to be put on my embouchure, my, my throat, my breathing, my tongue, um, as well for me personally. Um, you know, so that, that it changes a lot for me. Now, some people, like I said, some people do great with it and use it as a, a tool to remind themselves of, of their alignment. Um, for me, I find that it gets in my way. What do you think, um, Jackie, for uh, you were talking about both Alexander and Feldenkrais in addition to body mapping for a student or a professional who is experiencing a lot of pain or discomfort or having any sorts of overuse problems? Um, I which one of these three do you think would be the most helpful in addressing those problems or would all of them be good? You know, it, it is really what the individual responds to. And it could be that, you know, they would really respond well to this Feldenkrais teacher or this Alexander teacher or this body mapping teacher. And my, my advice is just find someone, start with something, maybe whatever's closest to you or um, you know, the, the thing that you have a connection with or, uh, uh, anything. Um, and then you can always kind of go from there. Um, that's, that's my, my two cents on it. Um, it, one thing that I, I do enjoy about body mapping is the fact that we ask a lot of questions in regards to how are you thinking about this? How are you feeling about this? And that is, that is one thing that it helps lead to self-exploration so that you as a learner, as a student can start to process some of this stuff yourself and, and figure out some of those answers. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking about a couple of things you mentioned. Um, and, um, I, what is what would be if you can single out what would be the single most important thing that body mapping is the most beneficial to you you mentioned a lot of things you know all that freedom that you gained all that um, 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 injury or pain-free playing that you have gained throughout the years but what do you think what is what is the most cherished contribution of body mapping, the, the act of body mapping to you personally, if there is one. That is so hard. Um, <laughs> you know, one of the things that I really cherish um, is the, the fact that I am able to process emotions and thoughts and taken in information from within my body as well as outside the body. So that's interoception, exteroception. Um, and I'm able to 
process this together as I'm playing so that it's not um, such a... It's not left a chance. Right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I feel like I have more control, but it's it's like by letting go of the thought of control. <laughs> okay. Able to process it in the moment. So pretty much you bring all those into your awareness, right? Is what yeah. you're saying that actually things are in your awareness and because of that you can you can make positive natural changes on the way you you feel, you move, you play, you perform. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. That's, that's I'm really curious. Uh, sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I'm curious, you know, I know, Jackie, you said you don't like the next strap, but um, did you find that with your numbness of the right arm that it helped to get an adjustable thumb rest or a special kind of thumb rest? Or what did you, was that one of the things you looked into? Yeah, absolutely. So, and thank you for asking that. Um, so it took me a while to like, when I say a while, I mean, many years um, to, to find something that I felt really helped with that. Um, and that's the Kuiman thumb rests. Um, I have, two, I, there's two different models. There's the A23 and then there's the professional model, which I can't remember the the, the title for that, but I have both of them. One of my B flat clarinet, one of my A clarinet, and both of them provide significant relief for the thumb because what it does is it, it has a little wing on it. So the pressure is no longer right here. It's right here. So you're still having contact with the instrument. Um, it is thicker. Um, so there's more space it between the thumb and the fingers because you know normal thumb rest you're about like this the kuiman does add some um some width to that so they're a little bit further apart but also because of that little wing and it distributes the weight of the instrument differently and immediately when i first tried it i felt so much freedom here in my hand and my fingers um that that helped me significantly in the moment when I was in school, um, I did use an extra strap for a little while just to get the pressure off. And I felt like I did need to play. And, um, but ultimately I didn't use the next strap for long. It was just a, a tool that I used for a little bit. And, um, and really it was about taking time for myself, you know, I realized that, you know, signing up for six ensembles each semester was probably not the smartest thing. <laughs> um, I realized that my practice schedule, I had to adjust that. I had to be mindful of how I was approaching the instrument and taking breaks. You know, I would, I'm right-handed. So like I carry everything in my right hand. I had to quickly learn that I need to be aware of that and I need to use my left hand more. Um, and so it was just kind of a mindfulness throughout the day really, you know, every day of how am I using my right arm? And, um, and also, you know, that first lesson that I had with the Alexander technique teacher and body mapping teacher that I first had contact with, she, she talked about the arm structure. So I immediately was able to think about that and start fixing that, um, and learning about that. So that initial, um, information was really, um, crucial in my recovery. Absolutely. Um, Jack, you mentioned a um, couple of um, practices or, or yeah, that you, you, you've done, for example, constructive rest. What are some of the things that body mappers or, or those that use body map, they can do either daily or weekly, some practices that they can implement in their performance practice or, or playing? Sure. So um, because body mapping is basically stemmed from Alexander Technique, there's a lot of things that do kind of overlap and constructive rest is one of those um, that I, I talk about um, all the time. And it's where you lie down on the floor, semi-supine. So your feet are on the floor, knees towards the ceiling, and you're lying down on the floor and 
and you're just allowing yourself um, time to kind of decompress. You can put your attention to your breath. You can think about releasing into the floor. There's a lot of different strategies within that. Um, and I've actually started to look into mindfulness um, and meditation and things like that. And I think that you could actually combine that while, you know, doing some mindfulness while you're on the floor. Um, and that's something that I do about maybe 10 to 15 minutes before I practice um, each day. And it just, it helps me to um, get connected with my body allow my mind to kind of slow down and get focused to what I'm about to do. And that is something that really has helped with my um, self-awareness and understanding of my body um, as I, as I go into practice and performance. Um, some other techniques, you know, are some, some very basic ones that it's not even necessarily specific to body mapping, but um, in my experience, playing in front of a mirror or and recording myself, video recording, those things are just so incredibly informative. And if I'm not practicing in front of a mirror, then I start to develop things, um, habits that I'm not aware that I'm even doing. Um, so I do practice in front of the mirror a lot. And um, one thing that I, I tell my students all the time, and I have to reiterate all the time as a, just a gentle reminder, is having contact with the floor. So um, I talk about the tripods of the feet a lot. The tripods um, are the, the heel, the ball of the big toe, the ball of the little toe. And if we can allow ourselves to keep that into our, our attention, and, and allow ourselves to kind of balance within those tripods, then a lot of other things just kind of fall into place. Absolutely. So what do you say then um, that body mapping is for those that misuse the body um, in, their, in, the, in the way they act, in the way they practice, they perform? Or would you say that body mapping is also for those people that might have an inherited hereditary um, a thing that prevents them from a, um, a natural play or performance, what would you say? I think it's for everyone. I mean, ideally, what our aim is is to prevent injury for, so that we don't have any limitations, um, that we're not in pain. That's our ideal with body mapping is we want to, we want to give this education that will keep you as, as a healthy musician um, throughout your career. Now, if there are um, any sort of physical anomalies, then body mapping can be a great way to understand how the body is designed. Also, you would have to bring the knowledge of how your body is designed. So if there is some sort of, you know, anomaly that within your body, you have to know that, but then coming to find the way that your body moves the best, that's, that's what our goal is. If there is some sort of, of, um, you know, physical, um, limitation or anything like that is like, well, what can we do and how can we do it in the best way, the most efficient, the least amount of tension, um, make it the, the freest way possible. Absolutely. So you mentioned certified body mapping educators. Can you tell us a little bit more about who are the certified or licensed body mapping educators and, and what is the course they take to be certified? Um, a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, our training process is, um, it's not a rigid class type of thing. It's it's um, more individually based. And th so the curriculum is, is the same in regards to um, when we are licensed body mapping teachers, we are licensed to teach a course that's called What Every Musician Needs to Know About the Body. It's a six hour course that um, goes through different topics. So the first one is basically 
uh, it's, it's divided into six hours. Um, the first hour is attention and um, kind of an introduction to somatic practices. Um, the second one is balance. The third is arm structure, then breathing, then legs. And then the last hour is basically a master class. Um, so some students will get up and perform. And then the body mapping teacher will interact with them in a master class type setting using yeah. principles. Um, and our, our goal is always, as body mapping teachers, it's always about the music. How can we use our body in a way that will benefit our music making? That's, that's our goal. And so when... Um, when people go through this training, they work very closely one-on-one -on -one with um, either um, training mentors and, well, not either or. They work first with training mentors and then sponsoring teachers um, to really get that um, specialized information. And um, when they become licensed, then they, they do come to our web, or they don't come to our website. They get placed on our website as a licensed teacher. So we have a list of, um, of licensed teachers that you can find based on your location or what instrument you play. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of us out there and we all um, love to, to talk about body mapping and music and how we can make better music. Absolutely, thank you. How many licensed educators are out there? Is it a really big organization? That is an excellent question. Um, I am not entirely sure off the top. That's okay. Of my head. Um, I could probably find that pretty quickly. That's okay. Yeah. Well, you mentioned that uh, the membership is uh, three hundred or over over three hundred. It's uh, active members is about three hundred. Okay. There's. Um, Spread, spreading the world? Yes. Yes. And that is one of the initiatives that we're taking right now as we really want to broaden our international membership. So I assume the members get access to all sorts of webinars and workshops and master classes and things. Is that the advantage to Absolutely. Yes. As a member, you get access to, um, I believe we're having monthly webinars. Um, there are uh, open forums where we'll have just like some movement explorations for the members. Um, some of these activities you can join as a non-member. Um, and so, so we do offer that um, for the webinars. You can um, pay $10 to view a webinar if it's of particular interest um, to you. And there's also discounts to certain publishers and um, access to uh, materials, teaching materials, if you become a trainee or a, a licensed member. So there, there's a lot that we that we offer and that we provide for our members. And that leads me to my to our last question. Uh, what are some of the literature that anyone can read, get access to, or that the ABME um, educators they put out? And I, I had I had taken a little peek on the website www.bodymap.org and recommended readings, and I saw some articles, some books, some videos, um, so um, audio video materials. Um, can you tell us a little bit about those um, resources? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's a wide variety um, of of different options there. So like you mentioned, there are books. There are, um, there's a series that, um, that started whenever we were at, at excuse me, and over educators, <laughs> um, that is what every musician needs to know about the body. And there are some instruments, oh my goodness, instrument specific uh, books, you know, there's uh, one for flutist, there's some breathing books for different instruments. Um, there's a, a ton of, of books, websites, articles, um, like you mentioned, videos too. There's a DVD called Move Well, Avoid Injury, which is really fantastic information. 
Um, so there's a lot out there and I would just encourage you to go to that website that you mentioned, um, bodymap.org and, and kind of explore it and see what appeals to you. Absolutely. I remember many years ago, that was, uh, Stephen Kaplan's Obo Emotion. Um, he's a professor at, uh, Obo professor at UNLV. Um, and I really, that was the very, very, very first writing that I read about, um, our body. I didn't know anything about body mapping, but I read and it was very revelatory reading to me personally in many, many aspects and respects of the body, how I move, how um, we put our body into a, a proficient use for our um, instruments. Um, I, I learned so much and I could implement just by not even just, just reading, not even contacting anyone, just implement and soak in as much as possible. It was very, very, very beneficial. And it changed many of the ways I I, I play today. Yeah. yeah, for sure. That was um, one of the first books I bought too, actually. Um, and a shameless plug here, um, Sean Copeland and I are actually finishing up a book, Body Mapping for Clarinetists. Um, Wonderful. Yeah, so we, we've written it all. It is all there. We're just kind of in the, the process of, of editing and getting it published. So hopefully very soon it will be That's available to the clarinet. Community. Fantastic. Please let us know when that comes out. What a great resource that will be. So would that mean uh, you mentioned it's, it's called the breeding book for clarinetists? It, it's actually body mapping for clarinetists. Body mapping. Okay. And then another shameless plug. plug. Um, yeah, we're working on a second book called The Breathing Book for Clarinetists. <laughs> okay. So does, does it mean that The Breathing Book specifically focuses on breathing for yes. the clarinetist and the body mapping for clarinetist is, is a broad book covered in any detail that a clarinetist might be interested in regarding their bodies? Yes, absolutely. It basically does go through the the course what every musician needs to know about the body but it specifically we dive in deep and we specifically talk about um how we as clarinetists can use this information um and then the breathing book is going to be more of like a a workbook where we talk we introduce topics and there will be like playing examples and things like that so we're really excited there's a lot of information that we want to get out there to you all that's Absolutely. great. Absolutely. Um, Rebecca, do you have any other questions by any chance um, you might have on your mind? Um, I'm just curious, you know, this is kind of a personal question, but I know you, you shared with us, you know, your personal struggle with pain and, you know, numbness in your arm. And I, now that you're, are, you are so knowledgeable in body mapping, um, what would you say is sort of the increase in practice time that you're able to do as compared to what you were able to do when you were in pain before you had, you know, encountered any um, knowledge about body mapping? Um, so the knowledge that I've gained, it's basically been uh, um, learning how to listen to my body to understand what is telling me. So like when I was in undergrad and I was really dealing with that, I had to take lots of breaks. Um, it was recommended to me that I play for 15 minutes a day or 15 minutes at a time and then take a 10 to 15 minute break. And then you could do another 15 minutes. Um, so, you know, now I'm able to go to a orchestra rehearsal that, you know, in the course of one evening, it's like, Oh, it's like from five to 10. And then we, have, of course, we have a dinner break and a few small breaks. But within that, I create more breaks for myself. And, um, you know, I'll put my clarinet down. I'll put my right arm down. I will, you know, just kind of do some small movements within my chair. And just that alone can really help kind of continue the blood flow and, and keep things from getting, uh, for lack of a better word, stuck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it's, it's all about listening to your body and, and understanding what it's trying to tell you and, and how we can pace ourselves as we mm -hmm. play. Thank you. Yeah. 
Well, Jackie, um, we are truly grateful that you hopped on this call this morning, today, and then you told us a lot about body mapping in terms of musicians, performers, and clar clarinetists. Um, so thank you very much for joining this. Thank webinar. you so much. And yeah, podcast. this was just wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for asking me to do this and being willing to let me talk about body mapping. And um, I really appreciate the opportunity. It's been really fun. Thank you.